Yes, it has started. It has started. Let me now share the screen. I hope I am. Good. All right. So I allow this later. Okay. See what what we will do today is that so we have built a number of circuits. Uh, so you can view any logic circuit. Am I am I uh, audible? Just anybody, just confirm I'm audible or not. Yes. Sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. So you have a you have a logic circuit, and let's say it has a number of input. Let's say call it X1, X2, X3. And it has an output which is let's say called Y. Right. So inside this box, there are gates and uh, various types of basic gates. And they are connected in some way in a cascade manner or some way. But if we look at the box, you can sort of express this output y as some function of x1, the inputs, as some function of the inputs. Okay, so one more thing we studied in this class is that this, this x1, x2, x3, as well as y, they are binary valued. That means they can take value either 1 or 0. And uh, what we what we now want to and we have studied several kind of kind for example f can be an adder f can be an uh, f can be an comparator so f can be anything but it uh, so but in all the cases f is some kind of a function from the input to the output so our next goal uh, in in this module of the course is to study this function in more detail what kind of functions can be implemented using only logic gates of course they will be boolean functions but what are their nature how, how how do we deal with them how do we manipulate these functions and uh, what we have is that we will often see that these functions can be represented by what is known as boolean expressions Boolean expressions. So what is a Boolean expression? It's something like some variables and maybe they are complement or something like that. And they are connected by some operators and then put a dot, which is the and and the or operator. So they are represented by this kind of Boolean expression. So what we want to do next is that instead of just talking about that this is a Boolean expression and all that, we will we would like to do a theoretically sound mathematical representation of these functions. We would like to do a 
mathematical representation of these functions. And we want to study the properties that this function satisfy in terms of the mathematical representation. And why are we doing this? Because uh, our, from a design point of view, from a practical point of view, our thing is that given some, some logic you want to implement, we look at these expressions. So there are three steps. First is you write down logical expression. Then there is a step, something called a minimization of the logic expression or the Boolean expression. That means you, you convert the expression into an equivalent form, which is easier to implement, which is requires less number of gate, which is smaller, which is less costly. So these manipulations which convert a, any given Boolean expression into a minimum form, in a minimal form, those transformations are very important for, for to us from the implementation point of view. They are, they are uh, important to us. And in order to study what are valid transformations and what type of transformations would help us, we would need to study the mathematical basis of, uh, or, or some kind of mathematical representation of these functions. And that is what we are going to do today. So the goal of whatever mathematical foundation we study today is to help us in this minimization process or this transformation process. Okay, so with this, let me go back to my slides. Are the slides visible? Just anybody confirm the slides are visible? Yes, 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 thank you. All right, so we'll start a, uh, from a little more uh, fundamental objects like sets and relations. And finally, we'll we'll end up defining an object called an lattice. And we'll see that all these Boolean functions we talked about, they can be represented as lattices. So it is, it, these lattices are a nice representation, nice mathematical representations of these Boolean logic functions that we so far has been dealing with. Uh, some of these topics uh, you have already studied in uh, discrete structure, but nevertheless, we are again uh, repeating them because I, I even, I mean, after so many years, I also keep forgetting the definition sometimes and confused between them. So it is always better to uh, repeat them once more. Uh, some of you who uh, I, I many of you already remember them, that's very good. Uh, if you remember them well, and if I make a mistake, you correct me. Okay. So let's start from the very basic. Uh, so you know, uh, you, we, we start with uh, everything is, the basis of everything is something uh, called a set. So it's a collection of elements. And th th these are some examples. So the set of all uh, natural numbers, all, all integers, or uh, zero to uh, all the integers, or the, say, if you drop the zero, all the positive integers, one, two, three, these are all example of sets. You can have the, so Z plus and Z, uh, you, you can have all the in integers from negative and positive. So these are all examples of set. There are two special sets, as you know, universal sets, which comprises of everything, and the empty set or the null set, which does not have any element. Okay, so there are uh, there are some Russell paradox. So if we consider the set of all uh, all element uh, all sets which do not belong to itself, so is is that set a, a element of set? Okay, so there are there are many. Uh, so in fact. The very definition of set depends on some fundamental assumptions in mathematics. Uh, axiom of choice and other, it depends on fundamental assumptions. Okay, uh, but what we are more interested, in, assuming that there is a definition of a set, what we are interested in is set operations. That means given two or more sets, uh, I want to, uh, I want to, uh, uh, produce a third set. Say you are given two sets A and B. I want to produce a third set by some way operating on these two sets. So A and B are kind of operands, and 
this in this case the union the set union is an operator and a union b after applying that operator on these two sets you get a third set which is the inter union of these two sets okay so this kind of operators on sets are what we are more interested in and moment we have these operators that means you have basic sets and then you have operators on them we start having an algebra over the sets so algebra is nothing but how do you manipulate objects and how do you manipulate objects the way you manipulate objects is you apply operator on them either unitary operator or binary operators you start applying operator on them and create new newer objects and create newer objects okay so uh, the rules which apply to these operators the rules which apply to creation of these newer objects uh, would follow some laws or axioms and a system uh, comprising of certain sets certain operators and certain axioms would be called an algebra uh, so in the set we have some basic operations uh, which you know of that is the union operation which is obvious the intersection operation so these are the venn diagrams uh, representing the output of applying these operators and then you have the complement or the bar operator okay so this bar is also sometimes represented as a prime or a tilde before that so it's the complement operator so these three are the fundamental operators in the set algebra okay so using these operators you can define other derived uh, derived operations for example using the intersection and the complement operation you can define the set difference operation this way by combining several such operators and maybe several such input operands you can create what are called expressions which are basically more complicated outputs so you can for example you can have an expression a union b intersection c where taking three input sets a b and c you create a more complex set by applying this operator so this would be called an expression not one thing that you have a notion of the value of an expression that means if you evaluate this a union b intersection c if you evaluate this you get another set so the input is a set output is also a set that's what is important in algebra okay so now uh, there are some laws or axioms what axioms mean uh, mean is that there are two uh, you, you can write down two expressions in terms of uh, sets and their operators you can write two expressions and say that these two expressions are the same that means if you apply the, the output uh, if you apply the same input to the first expression and if you apply to the second input uh, same input to the second expressions the output sets that you get after evaluating the expressions would be same for both these expressions usually one of the expression is we call a left hand side expression and the other expression we call a right hand side expression and these two expressions for same input would produce the same output okay so here is an uh, and this would be called uh, and this holds for all inputs this holds for all possible inputs then it would be called a axiom or a law it should be called a law so here is a common law in set algebra you know the de morgan's law that is the complement of a union b is a complement intersection b complement so this is a law the left hand side and the right hand side expression for whatever value of a and b you take they would produce the same set they would produce the same set so this is a law and it's easy to verify this law if you this is a simple venn diagram kind of thing so if you take any a any b and a union b is this pink area and similarly you take the complement of a which is the area outside a and complement of b which is the area outside b and if you take their intersection you see it again becomes this pink area so you have kind of well this is not a proof really but you have kind of uh, convinced that uh, th this is true 
de morgan's law holds uh, you have the dual de morgan's law which says we'll we'll come back about this do every algebra has some dualities in terms of their operators we'll talk about these dualities you see the difference between the first law and the second law is only that we have replaced we have interchanged the union with the intersections we have just interchanged the union with the intersections okay so it's it's the dual law of the first law okay what the dual law says that the complement of a intersection b is complement of a union complement of b so this is another law this also you can easily verify using the venn diagram okay there is uh, one more uh, so there are many other such laws of uh, of offset algebra there are other sub laws of offset algebra and and why these laws are useful again you can see you can see that this left hand what this law says is that left hand side is equivalent to the is equal to the right hand side that means for same input to the left hand side as well as the right hand side would get the same output for all possible inputs so uh, since they are equivalent if i have an expression involving the left hand side i can substitute the right hand side instead so you have an expression where a part of the expression involves the left hand side of a law you can as if substitute it by the right hand side without disturbing the expression the expression is the same remains the same if you if you substitute the left hand side by the right hand side that means you have transformed an original expression into another expression without disturbing the validity of the expression that means the expression logically is the same but it is expressed in a different way mm, the different way i have obtained by applying this law for transforming one into the other and again as i said before we are interested in some transformation in the first place because we want to do a series of transformations so that we end up with the final expression which is a small smith uh, which is a simpler or a smaller exp expression in terms of number of gates you require to implement it in terms of the uh, say the power you you burn to run that circuit or the timing delay of the circuit whatever it is in some terms it is a better expression to implement okay so that's why these laws in the algebra are important to us we will we'll study them okay uh, let me define another important uh, thing in the set theory which will be useful to us later it's the definition of power set of a set a denoted by this script pa power set of a set a so the power set of a set a is another set comprise whose elements are not elements of a but but subsets of a so uh, the power set of a set a is a is a set whose elements are all possible subsets of a uh, this also i think all of you know whose elements are all possible subsets of a so if your set is say only two element set a comma b a and b two element set then all all possible subsets are null only a only b and ab full a set so this four element set note that the elements of the power set of a are not this a or b they are subsets of the set ab so they are sets themselves so null is a null set empty set a is a singleton set b is a singleton set ab is a two element set so these are the elements of subset so naturally you can easily verify that if a set a has a cardinality n the power set will have a cardinality 2 to the power n because or there are two to the power n possible subsets of a if a is of cardinality n okay there is another definition we would uh, like to like to have uh, let x1 to xa be a, a collection of subsets of a so you you take a collection of subsets of a so uh, basically x1 to xa are nothing but elements of the power set of a 
these are nothing but the elements of the power setter. You take any element, uh, so uh, this should be. Uh, well, I, let me see if I can write. Why is this pen not working? Anyway, pause it. OK, so uh, let's take uh, uh, let's pick up elements from the power set. X1 to XA. This collection of elements X1 to XA. Uh, note that I, I don't talk about single elements X1 to X. I talk about some some group of some collection of X1 to XA would be called it a partition of A. If they are exhaustive and exclusive. Exhaustive means if they are exhaustive, well, so if you take the union of x1, x2, x3, xk, you get back a. Okay, so if you if you if you put together x1 to xa, you get you, you get your full set a. That means it is this is called the exhaustive property. And if you take any two xi, xa from i equal to 1 to k, j equal to 1 to k, if you take any two xi, xa, they have an empty intersection. There is no overlap between any of x i x a. They have an empty intersection. If i not equal to k, of course. This is the exclusivity property. Okay. So if a collection of subsets x1 to x a follow the exhaustive and the exclusivity property, then that collection is called a partition of a. It's called a partition of a. Mm. I think this is also clear to you, but let me see if I need to draw a diagram. I need to explain. Maybe you remember all this, but I'm not sure what you remember. Okay, so let's say this is the set A. And this is a you, I'm drawing a number of subsets of A and I'm calling them X1, X2, X3, X4, X5 and X6. You see, if you take X1 union, X2 union, X3 union, X4 union, X5 union, X6, you get back A. And similarly, if you pick up any two, Let's say x3, x2. You get a null. They do not overlap. So this, this is a, this collection x1 to x6 is a partition of A. Is a partition of A. Okay. Uh, simple. I mean, I, I, I am sure all of you know this. OK, so uh, these are two important definitions, the power set and the partition, which you keep in mind. Uh, here is an example. See, uh, this is also an uh, important example. So there is a one, there is one partition which, which any, any set has. So if you, any universal set. Has. So if you take the universal set U, which is this rectangle, and given any two sets A and B, then the sets, the subsets of U, uh, the following subsets of U, A intersects and B bar, A intersects and B bar, that is this area, B intersects and A bar, which is this area, A intersects and B, which is this common area, and A union B bar, which is this pink area. Four sets constitute a partition of U. So, any a, given any two sets A and B, they naturally produce a partition on the universal set U. And the partition is just this. They always produce a partition. Okay, so uh, I am writing down here some of the uh, laws or axioms or rules of the set algebra and again I repeat rules means 
I have two expressions and I say that these two expressions are one and the uh, are, are equivalent for whatever value of the upper input operands or whatever value of the input operand left hand side and the right hand side two algebraic expressions are always the same. They may have different operators, they have, may have different operands, but they evaluate to the same thing for all inputs. That's important for all inputs. Okay, so let's write down some, mm, let's write down some, uh, some such laws of set algebra. Again, I repeat, the purpose of this law is that if you have a if you have a uh, expression, you can sort of reduce the expression by applying this law. That means substituting the left hand side by the right hand side. Okay, idempotence. Idempotence. What it says is that if you take a set A and union it with itself as many times as you want, I have written here two times but it actually holds if you apply it as many times as you want. Say A union, A union, A union, A union, A. Okay, so it's kind of uh, it, it, uh, uh, with itself if you apply union, uh, whatever number of times you want, you still get, get back A. Okay, so in some sense, this applying union with itself is kind of meaning useless. It, it gives you back the same thing. And the similar thing holds from A intersection A also. As many times you ap apply the intersection operator on its with itself, you get back the same thing. Okay, so this is idempotence. Then you have associativity. Okay, by the way, one more thing I forgot to mention that I said that uh, expressions in an algebra are, are some operands, in this case, some sets, and some operators, in this case only three operators, union, intersection, and complement. And these operands combined by these operators. Very important thing you can you can use in, in expressing and in writing down an expression are parentheses, which basically um, tells you the precedence or the order in which you should apply the operators. It tells you about the precedence the orders in which you should apply the operator. For example, if I put a parenthesis here, this means that first you should take the union between A and B and whatever is the result, with that you should take union of C. So you can you can apply parenthesis. It has the usual meaning in, in, in normal algebra that you, uh, that you studied also. Okay, so what associativity means is that you can change the position of your parenthesis. You can move the position of your parenthesis and still the expression should remain the same. Still the expression should remain the same. So, uh, for example, if you have, if you first do, uh, what that again means, what that again means is that you can change the sequence or you can change the order in which you perform the operations. And you'd get, uh, it doesn't matter in what order you perform the operations, you get the same results. So for example, if you first take union of B and then take union of C, the result that you'd get would be one and the same of what you get by first take union of B and C and then taking the results union with A. The, the, the overall result will be same for both. What is the value of A and B and C? Okay. So this is associativity. What associative basically means is that you can change the order of evaluating the expressions if the expressions involved are of this form. If the expressions are of this form. Okay. Uh, the associativity, there is one more associativity that holds. Uh, if you have an expression A intersects and B union C with a parenthesis here, that means first you compute, first you evaluate A intersection B and the result you union with C, whatever you get is one and the same as first you take the union of B and C, so and then you take the intersection with A. So you see, I have just moved the parenthesis. 
have just moved the parentheses. I have changed the order of computation. And but that doesn't affect the result. OK, any questions so far? OK, I hope all of you are listening. Anyway, so uh, 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 commutativity. Commutativity means that you can change the position of the operands. So A union B is same as B union A. You can change the order of the operands. You can change the position of the operands. Similarly, A intersection B is B intersection A. And then you have distributivity. Hmm. Hmm. You, you usually say that union distributes intersection. That means if you have A union within bracket B intersection C, it's just the usual whatever you have done in normal arithmetic, integer arithmetic or floating point arithmetic, whatever you have done, uh, similar thing happens in set algebra also. Hmm. Whatever done you in normal algebra, in high school algebra, over numbers, you have the same thing in here also, for sets also. So union distributes intersection. A union B intersection C is A union B intersection A union C. Similarly, but this rule you see, yeah, oh, okay, this is this also distributes. So A intersection B union C is A intersection B union A intersection C. Okay, this also distributes. <coughs> uh, then you have an identity. That means if you take the in union of A with the null set, you get A. If you take union of A with the universal set, you get the universal set. Similarly, if you get the intersection of A with null set, you get the uh, you get the null set. If you take the union of A with the universal set, sorry, this would be intersection. This would be intersection. Intersection of A with the universal set, you get back A. So you see again, See, I think you have noticed one thing that left hand, uh, this, this first column, the rules I have written down in the first column and the rules I have written down in the second column, they are just dual of each other. If you interchange the union with intersection, you, the, you get one rule from the other rule. They are, they are dual of each other. Okay, involution. So this is a very important uh, rule. This this uh, are relaxed in some exotic kind of sets. So the complement of complement of a set A is the set itself. Complement of complement of set A is the set itself. And then there are some rules involving con complements. Uh, the complement of the universal set is the null set. The union of the set, any set A with its complement is the universal set. The complement of the null set is the universal set. Intersection of any set A with its complement is the null set. That's the definition of the complement set. It's the null set. And finally, you have the de Morgan's law, which is I have stated before. Complement of A union B is A complement intersection B complement. Complement of A intersection B is A complement union B complement. Okay, so these are all the rules or axioms or laws you have in set algebra. And these are always true in the sense that whatever may be the value of A, B, these are always true. This doesn't depend on a particular A or B. Okay, now uh, let us quickly recapitulate what a relation is. First, let me define what is a tuple. A tuple is nothing but an ordered pair of set elements. So this is a two tuple A in AB represented by the left angle and the right angle enclosed in the left angle and the right angle. This is a, the next one is a three tuple where four B alpha are elements of some set. Cartesian product of two sets A and B is the is another set comprising whose elements are all such tuples. All such tuples means all possible tuples you can ever construct 
by using elements from A and B. So you take pick up any element from A, pick up element A from A, A pick up any element B from B, they are ordered pair A, B is a valid tuple and is an element of the Cartesian product A cross B. And uh, and if you if you allow this uh, such to if you allow all possible such tuples, the set you get is the entire Cartesian product. So if if uh, the set A has m elements and the set B has n elements, the cardinality of the Cartesian product is m times n. So here are some examples. So A B C is one set A. Alpha beta is another set B. You con you you con you include in the Cartesian product all possible ordered pairs comprising elements of A and elements of B. Okay. Uh, now we define a binary relation R on the set A and B as any subset of the Cartesian product. Okay, you, you pick up any subset of the Cartesian product, we call it a relation on the set and A and B. For example, uh, this is a Cartesian product of this A, B, C and alpha beta set. You take the first three elements, you take the subset, subset of A cross B comprising of the first three elements, that would define a relation. That would define a relation. And, uh, and so all these ordered pairs would be called since this relation r this would be script r relation r is a subset of a cross b uh, we would say that one particular ordered pair or element of the cartesian product belongs to the relation or do not belong to so for example if i have a relation comprising of a alpha b alpha and c alpha uh, this and this is my relation then these three tuples would belong to this relation and the other three tuples will not belong to this relation because the relation is a set. Uh, we can sometimes, uh, uh, which basically means is that you can define the relation as an indicator function or a characteristics function over the Cartesian product set. That means I have a kind of function uh, which gives a value one. So this function or what this function does, if you take any element of the Cartesian product, any ordered pair belonging to the Cartesian product, this function would produce a value one or a zero. It would produce a value one if that particular tuple belongs to the relation R, the subset R and zero otherwise. So it's kind of an indicator function or a characteristics function over the Cartesian product set. It, it basically denotes that you take a Cartesian product set, you pick up an element, it satisfies the relation or doesn't satisfy the relation, it just says that. You can take examples. For example, uh, let's say, um, um, let's say uh, ABC is the is the set of all uh, okay let abc is the set of all countries let's say three countries say india bangladesh and pakistan or three states let's say let's say uh, punjab haryana and say tamil nadu so these are three states and alpha beta are the some cities uh, let's say chandigarh and say madras chennai chandigarh and chennai and let's say I can do so all ordered pairs are let's say uh, Punjab, Ch Chennai, Punjab, Chandigarh, Haryana, Chandigarh uh, and so on. Okay, uh, uh, Punjab, Ch uh, Haryana, Chennai and so on. So all these ordered pairs I say and we'll say a relation is if the one city is the capital of that state. Okay, so the pairs say Punjab, Chandigarh or Haryana Chandigarh belongs to that relation. Tamil Nadu Chennai belongs to that relation. Other tuples say Punjab Chennai do not belong to that relation. Okay, so this is so a relation is nothing but a subset of tuples. The which subset? Uh, Punjab Chandigarh, Haryana Chandigarh, and Tamil Nadu Chennai. These 
three three element subset of the product set forms the capital relation. Okay, and what would be the indicator function? It would the indicator function or the characteristic function would be one for these three tuples and zero for the other tuples. All right, so there can be, uh, uh, for example, other things like uh, if A and B are the same set, for example, if A is the set of all positive integers and B is also the set of all positive integers, that is Z, we can say, we can talk about a relation called divisibility relation. That means one element A and another element B are related to each other if A divides B without remainder. A, 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 a perfectly divides B. So two divides four. It's a it's a, it's a member of the of the uh, dividing relation. So you can you can easily define give examples of such relations. Okay. Uh, uh, so uh, just to quickly recapitulate for people who have not done the discrete structure course. Uh, a Cartesian product of two sets is all possible tuples that you can construct using pair of elements, one from each set. A binary relation on the sets A and B is some subset, maybe it includes everything in, uh, is some subset of the Cartesian product A and B. For every binary relation, you have a characteristic function which marks the elements of the cross uh, of the A cross B, which satisfies the relation or doesn't satisfy the relation. That means belongs to R or doesn't belongs to R. Uh, now let us talk about some properties of the of the relations that we uh, talk about. Okay, uh, so one relation is called a reflexive if an element X of A is always related to itself. Okay, it's always related to itself. So if you take pick up any X from A, the, the uh, relation X R X always holds. Okay, so any element of set A is always related to itself. For example, the divisibility uh, relation, if we talk about any integer divides itself. So reflexibility holds. If if this thing holds for all x, then we said that particular relation is reflexive. Okay, uh, a relation is called symmetric if for any x and y in A, if x is related to y, it implies y is also related to x. If x is related to y, y is also related to x. Okay. And this should hold not for any particular x and y, but all pos all x and y in A. This, this is an important point. This should hold for all x and y in A. All x and y in A. So uh, if you pick up any two x and y, if I find that x is related to y, if they're not related, I cannot say anything. If x is indeed related to y, then definitely we can say y is also related to x. If this is true, then I call the relation to be symmetric. Uh, the divisibility is not a symmetric relation. If A divides B, doesn't mean that B divides A. Uh, transitivity, if you have three elements, X, Y, and Z in A, note that I am talking about uh, earlier, I, uh, in general, the relation can be defined over two sets, A and B, binary relation. But I am taking a special case where B is same as A. So I'm talking about relations which are subset of A cross A. A cross A. Otherwise, this doesn't make sense. I'm talking about relations A cross A. Okay, uh, transitivity. If you take three elements X, Y, and Z, if X is related to Y and Y is related to Z, it implies X is related to Z. Okay, uh, so let's see what this means actually. Let me draw a diagram too. A 
explain this. Okay, let's say this is element X. This is my one element Y, and this is my one element Z. What does reflexivity mean? So, how I will represent relations? I will represent relations by direct arrow that means if x is related to i will draw a direct arrow from x to y i'll draw an arrow from x to y okay similarly if x is related to z i'll draw an arrow from x to z i'll draw a direct arrow okay so if r is reflexive if r is reflexive what it means for all the elements, let's say there are only three elements. There are only three elements in A. For all the elements, so X is related to X, Y is related to Y, and Z is related to Z. This means I have this kind of self loops. I have this kind of self loops. Okay, now let us look at symmetry. Which means if X is related to Y, implies Y is related to X. What it means? If, X, if I have an arrow from X to Y, it definitely means there is a back arrow like this. And this should hold for all x, y. For all x, y. OK, so let's say I have two relations. So let's say x is related to y. It definitely means this will be there. Let's say y is also related to z. It means the this back thing will be there. Now let us look at the third condition, which is transitivity. This means if X is related to Y and Y is related to Z, as we have drawn, it implies X is related to Z. So that means if I have this arrow and I have this arrow, I definitely have this arrow. Okay, I definitely have this arrow. And by symmetry, if I have this arrow, if, if symmetry holds, they may hold independently, but if all three of them holds, then I have also have this. OK, so that means you see if all these three properties hold for a relation, it's kind of there is a strong connection between X and Y and Z. If X and Y and Z are related by symmetry, transitivity and reflexivity, then they are kind of intimately. They are all connected to each other. They form a kind of a single unit like this. OK, so if all these three property holds, I would call R to be an equivalence relation. Equivalence relation. Hmm. So if X, Y and Z are related by an equivalence relation, you see there is a kind of strong connection between them. They are, they are completely interconnected to each other. That's why we call, call this as an equivalence relation. Uh, so one of the common example of equivalence relation is this. So if you take A, the set to be all integers, 
all positive in all integers, let's say. And the equivalence relation R is nothing but the if two integers are same. If two integers are same, if X and Y are identical, then only we call it as equivalence relation. Of course, it is kind of, you know, it is reflexive. That means an integer is related to itself. It is symmetric. If X is equal to Y, Y will definitely be equal to X. It is transitive also. If X is equal to Y and Y is equal to X, X is equal, equal to Z, X is equal to Z. Okay, so equality is the over the integers or any other thing is the classic example of an equivalence relation. So it means in this diagram is that everything is kind of related to each other. But often in, in, in many relations, uh, this may not be true. Hello. Huh. Oh, that's it. Okay. 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 I'm giving that. Huh. Hmm. Oh, in, in fact, there is another example we can talk about. Let's quickly do that. Let's say our set is the set is all lines, straight lines in two dimensions. It, 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 it maybe it holds for well in higher dimensions we don't call it a line anymore. But let's say we, our set consists of all lines in two dimensions. This is our set. Let me call it as say L. And uh, so let's say L1 is a line, L2 is a line. So I have L1 and L2. We'd say that L1 is related to L2 if L1 is parallel to L2. If L1 is parallel to L2, I say L1 is related to L2 over the set of all possible lines in two dimensions. Now you see it's reflexive. It's reflexive like a line is parallel to itself. It's symmetric. Symmetric. That means if L1 is parallel to L2, then definitely L2 is parallel to L1 and L1 is always parallel to itself. L1 is always parallel to itself. And also it is transitive. Because if you have a, sorry, not, these are not straight line anyway, so. The, I cannot draw a straight line. It's very difficult to draw a straight line. Okay, let's say they are parallel and straight lines. So L1, L2, L3. So if L1 is parallel to L2 and L2 is parallel to L3, then definitely L1 is parallel to L3. Transitive. Very simple. So these are very simple things. So I think you can you can uh, sort of think of uh, this parallel property of parallelism of two lines is a relation among all lines. If two line lines will be related if they are parallel, and they form this equivalence relation. They satisfy all these three properties. If a relation satisfies all these three properties, we call the relation to be an equivalence relation. We'll see that uh, there is one more thing you, you can uh, I'll, uh, let me just talk about it. So uh, suppose among all possible lines in two dimensions, suppose I group them, I group them, I group them into 
things like uh, so I, I i said that you can you have you have already talked about partition earlier earlier that means if you take a set and if you take a collection of subsets which are exhaustive and exclusive then they form a partition so if you take the set of all possible lines all possible lines all possible lines in the world and then uh, you group them into say groups such that they are parallel to each other so all lines which are parallel form a group all lines which are parallel to each other form a group group to form such groups and you will easily see that this is a partition in the sense that uh, these are exclusive of course if two lines are are parallel to each other they would belong to the same partition they would belong to the same subset and if they do not belong to the same subset they intersect they are not parallel of course i'm talking about euclidean geometry uh, uh, and then they are exhaustive because what i have done is that uh, you, you, i have i have taken all possible lines and i have taken subsets which are uh, so if i take all possible lines and I, I take subsets which are parallel to each other of course they will be exhaustive that means there is i will be not left out with a uh, with a line which is not parallel to it will be parallel to somebody so it will always belong to a partition so it is exhaustive so this is another example there are many more examples of of equivalence relation okay so there is uh, i think equivalence relation uh, those who have studied discrete structure might have studied in great details uh, but that is uh, we are not really interested directly in equivalence relations here we are interested in another type of relation where i would replace the symmetric property by something called an anti symmetric property a symmetric property by something a sort of and anti symmetric property so um, what is the anti symmetric property a relation r over a cross a is said to satisfy the anti symmetric property if you take any x and y from a if you take any x and y from a if both x and y if both the tuples x and y and y and x so if x is related to y as well as y is related to x it would mean that x is same as y okay it would mean that x is same as y that means if 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 x is related to y then either y will not be related to x or y will be equal to x either uh, either they will be equal or they will not be related at all so that means in a in a in a uh, so see uh, so if we look at a relation if we if we see that if it will be anti symmetric it will be anti symmetric if you see you, you you look at the relation relation is a subset of the cartesian product okay so it is relation is nothing but a collection of tuples uh, some of the tuples of the cartesian product if you see if you examine the tuples if you see that uh, let's say a b as well as b a exist it means a is equal to b okay both cannot x if x both x y and y x cannot exist until and unless both x and y are same uh, in other words it means that if we find that x is related to y and we also find that y is related to x you can say that x is equal to y one simple example let's take the set of all integers and uh, say a is the set of all integers and i will say x is related to y if x is greater than so equivalence relation uh, sorry symmetric relation we talked about x is equal to y x is equal to y is an equivalence or, or, or that means also symmetric let's take x is greater than equal to y so if x is greater than y as well as y is greater than equal to x it will definitely imply x is equal to y 
if x is greater than y and y is greater than x, x would be equal to y. Okay, so this greater than equal to is an example of anti-symmetric relation. Just equal to is an example of symmetric relation. So in some, so in some cases, note again that this should hold for all x, y in a, not just for a single particular x, uh, instance of x and y, all x and y in a. Okay, so this anti-symmetric property, uh, of course, I mean, if, if for equivalence relation, we need reflexic symmetric transitive, uh, but sometimes if we, instead of symmetric, you have the anti-symmetric relation you may also have, and that's also interesting. There is one more relation we would later talk about. It's called an asymmetric relation. That means for all x, y, if x is related to y, then, def uh, then definitely y cannot be related to x. Y cannot be rule out y is related to x. In the anti-symmetric relation, uh, you don't really rule out. You say that it means x is equal to y. In anti-symmetric, you if x is related to y, you completely rule out y is related to x. If x is related to y, is, if a, b is there, b, a cannot be there. b, a cannot be there. Okay. In if a, b is there and b, a is there, it means a is equal to b. In asymmetric, if a, is, a, b is there, b, a cannot be there. Example, let's say, uh, again, take a set of all integers and you say that A is related to B if A is greater than B, just greater than, not greater than equal to, just greater than B. So that means if A is greater than B, under no circumstances B can be greater than A. Whereas if A is greater than equal to B, still B can be greater than equal to A if A is equal B. But if strictly greater than, if we take, if A is greater than B, B cannot be greater than A. This is an example of an asymmetric relation. Hmm. Anti-symmetric is greater than equal to. One example, of course, I'm, I'm just giving examples. Uh, hmm. So, so uh, let, let us uh, talk about, let us look at what it means in terms of the diagram that we had drawn. Okay, again, let's take three elements, X, Y, Z. Let's take an relation R denoted by an arrow. So if X is related to Y, I will draw an arrow from X to Y. So in case of equivalence relation, the arrows would look like this. If X is related to Y and Y is related to Z, then X also will be related to transitivity. And by flexibility, all the self loops will be there. And important thing, let me change the color. Anyway, let me draw a test line. So the symmetry property says that for equivalence lesson, if X is related to Y, Y should also be related to Z. So this is the symmetric property. Okay, this is the case of equivalence lesson. Now suppose I replace the symmetric property, other two properties are there. Other two properties are there. That means self loops are there. This is related to this, this is related to this, so transitivity is there. But this symmetric edge, symmetric arrow is not there. Okay, symmetric arrow is not there, so I have an anti symmetry. If that arrow is there, 
it means they are the same element x and y are the same element if if this other arrow is there okay they are the same element so again to this definition okay so let me now write down the definitions that we am looking for uh, equivalence relation a relation r is an equivalence relation if it is reflexic symmetric and transitive a partial order i am defining a new type of relation a partial order a relation r is a partial order if it is reflexive transitive just as an equivalence relation but you replace the symmetric property by the anti symmetric property okay and 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 okay one property i have talked about is that equivalence relation has always induces a partition and vice versa a partition also induces an equivalence relation but uh, well that, that is what uh, property of the equivalence relation but let's talk about partial order a partial order is kind of a relation which satisfies reflexive transitive and instead of symmetric anti symmetric so if x is related to y and y is related to x implies x and y are the same x is equal to y okay uh, so so you know what uh, so now let's define this is a partial order now let us look at one more property of the relation uh, okay let me let me just uh, just quickly mention one more thing about this partial order Okay, so let's take three elements x, y, and z. Okay, so self loop, if it is a partial order, self loops will be always be there. Reflexivity will always be there. Let's say x is related to y and y is related to z. So this means by transitivity, x will also be related to z. By transitivity, x will always be related to z. Uh, now, note one important thing. See, if if it was an equivalence relation, this this back back arrows would be there. So if x is related to y, y would also be related to z or related to x. So these back arrows would be there. But if it is a partial order, that means it is anti-symmetric, anti-symmetric. That means these back arrows are not there. Okay, if it is and if it is symmetric, the back arrows would definitely for every arrow there would be a back arrow. If it is anti-symmetric, the back arrows won't exist. There is only one arrow, the back arrow is not there. This has an important implication. This means I can if I arrange, if we, if I arrange this x, y, and z geometrically, if I place them in a particular order, the arrows will are only in one direction. Arrows are only in one direction. There is no back arrow. The arrows can all be aligned in one direction. So what I do is I take a convention that all arrows point up. Because arrows are in one particular direction, so I arrange x, y, and z in such a arrow a way that all arrows point up. All arrows point up. Right? So can I do this here? Can I do this here? Rather, instead of this, I, I rather say that, okay, all arrows point up. So can I kind of uh, do this here? What I is meant to do this here? So this is X. Let's say this is Y. This is a particular geometric arrangement of X, Y, and Z. So X goes to Y, it goes up. Y goes to Z, it goes up. 
and x gets to z it goes up hmm. and these self loops are there okay so if i if i adopt this convention that all arrows point up i can actually drop the arrow and replace them by lines so i can just represent them this way okay because i already have the convention i can automatically put the direction of the arrows because i know all arrows point up for the, for this i have to arrange the x y and z geometrically that way okay so this i can do without without losing information and since i know that uh, self loops are anyway there anyway always self loops are there for all x y and z i can drop the self loops yes they are implied i can drop the self loops okay not only that since i know transitivity is there hmm, i can drop the transitive edges also so i can just write it this way okay so just this diagram is enough for me this diagram is enough for me from this you can see i can easily reconstruct this diagram how what i'll do the reconstruct i'll put the direction to the arrows upward and by transitivity i'll connect x to z and by reflexivity i'll put the self loops okay but this is a uh, so from this diagram i can reconstruct but this i'll, I'll prefer this diagram this last diagram because it is cleaner it's easier to look at it's cleaner okay so this diagram is called a hasse diagram is called a hasse diagram it's kind of a graph like of thing where the nodes are the elements of the set and edges are representing relations okay uh, in partial order sometimes if there is edges we say x is compare because you you see we, this x x is related to y this r basically means we will sometimes say x is comparable to y x is similarly y is comparable to z and this diagram so you represent this partial order structure on certain sets by this kind of hasse diagrams Hmm. they basically represent these loops I'm sorry this this uh, graphical structure any questions any questions so far hope i'm audible and visible anyway uh, so let us look at another property of uh, of this kind of relations uh, so i'll call a relation to be connected if if you take any two elements of a x and y either x and y are comparable or y and x are uh, x and y are related or y and x are related so either x is related to y or y is related to x hmm. uh, say you, you take the relation over integers less than equal to so you take any two integers either the uh, any two integers x and y either x is less than equal to y or y is less than equal to x either of these will be there so then we call it a, so basically it means that if you take any two elements there will be an edge between them okay i either y x will in the by the hasse diagram either x will lie above y or y will be below x but there will be an edge between them okay if a partial order is connected okay one more thing i instead of uh, see uh, so i am still representing partial order by this script r symbol sometimes because uh, it, it originated from this less than equal to uh, kind of situation uh, so this uh, partial order is sometimes represented by this symbol this kind of uh, this kind of specialized less than equal to hmm. 
So this symbol is, uh, is uh, well, I mean, you, it's better to write it as R, but sometimes for convenience, we write it as this less than or equal to symbol uh, 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 on the, uh, as a partial order. So instead, I, instead of R, I will write X, this symbol, and then R, or then Y. Okay, X, this symbol, Y. Okay, a connected partial order is called a total order. A connected partial order is called a total order. Okay, a connected partial order is called a to total order. Let me uh, talk about some other properties uh, that will hold. Uh, for example, there is something called a irreflexive relation. That means that uh, in the in the diagram that you saw, the self loops are not there. X is never related to itself. X is never related to itself. Okay. Uh, typical example, say over the integers, if we take the strictly greater than relation, strictly greater than relation. So uh, a, an integer is never related, is not greater than itself. Okay. So it's an example of irreflexive relation. So a really irreflexive relation is one so that for all X, X is not related to itself. Asymmetric, we talked about earlier. If X is related to Y, Y cannot be related to X. If X is greater than Y, Y cannot be greater than X. It's an asymmetric relation. Okay, by the way, one more thing, this uh, total order, let me see how the Hasse diagrams look like in, in, in the total order. Okay, so hmm, let's have four elements, X, Y, Z, let's say U. Okay, so this is an, I'm drawing a Hasse diagram. So let's say this is a, this is a Hasse diagram. Okay. Now let's say in a total order, see there for uh, there will be uh, so either if you pick up any x and y, either x will be related to y or y will be related to x. So is this a total order? Hmm. But let's say look at this kind of thing. Uh, note one thing that I have not done the transitive relation. So if this is there and this is there, of course, this is there. Hmm. Similarly, uh, okay, this is the only transitive relation we have here. This is the transit. This is a transitive relation. So now, if I complete it in terms of the transitive relation, is it a total order? Anybody answer this? Is it a total order? Total order means if you pick up any two elements in this diagram, if you pick up any two nodes, there will be an connection between them. There will be a relation between them. Hmm. In the Hasse diagram, we don't draw the transitivity, but you have to infer them. Hmm. So is it a total order? No, Z is not Why? related with Y. Oh, uh, repeat again, I, your voice Z dropped. is not related with Y. Exactly. Z is not related to Y. Hmm. Uh, but let's take this situation. Yeah, is this a total order? Is this a total order? Because you know, by transitivity, I can draw this. And I can draw this. Yes, sir. Okay, so this is a total order. 
So if we think a little bit, you will see the Hasse diagram for the total orders will always look like a chain. Will always look like a chain. Okay, so moment you see a Hasse diagram which is like a chain, if you draw the transitivity, transitive edges, you can see that it will be a total order. All right, so this is an, uh, some, some trick kind of. If you just look at the Hasse diagram, you can immediately say it is a total order if it looks like a chain. Okay, uh, so we have talked about equivalence lessons, we have talked about partial order, we have talked about connected partial orders, which are total orders. Now let us talk about another type of uh, relation. Okay, so let's look at some of the property. So let's uh, let's talk about a relation which has these two properties. Uh, it is irre irreflexive, that means the self loops are not there, x is not related to itself. It is asymmetric, that means if x is related to y, y cannot be related to x. You rule out y x. If x y is there in the relation, you rule out y x. It's asymmetric. It's it's in anti-symmetric. If x is related to y and y is related to x, in only one case it is possible when y is equal to x. Here, in no case it is possible. So one is greater than equal to. This is strictly greater than. Okay, n relation would be called a strict order. A strict order if that relation is irreflexive and transitive. You can easily show that if it is irreflexive and transitive, it will also be asymmetric. It, it follows. It will also be asymmetric. So a irreflexive and a transitive relation it forms what is called a strict order. Now, uh, you can convert a partial order into a strict order and vice versa, a strict order into a partial order by slightly changing the definition of the relation, by slightly changing the definition of the relation. For example, this is a partial order. See this, this, this kind of um, special type of less than equal to, suppose this is a partial order in A. This is a partial order in A. What I do? I define a, so this is a relation that means if x is less than or equal to y, this I, I'll say that it belongs to the partial order. I define another relation instead of this special type of less than or equal to, I call it less than. I call it less than. And this less than I will define using this less than or equal to by slightly modifying this less than or equal to. I will say x is less than y is defined this way x is less than defined is defined this way. If x is less than y, if s x is less than equal to y and x is not equal to y. So I will say x is less than very intuitive. If x is less than y, if x is less than equal to y and x is not equal to y. Okay. So if you define if this less than equal to is a partial order and this less than is defined using this less than out of this less than equal to, then this less than forms a strict, strict order on A. This forms a strict order on A. Okay, so you can convert a partial order into strict order by changing the difference of the less than equal to less than by just ending the not equal to, uh, not equal to condition by just ending the not equal to condition with the partial order condition, which is x less than equal to y. Similarly, if just less than is a strict order, then I can define a less than equal to new relation as follows. I'll say x is related to less than equal to y if x is less than y or x is equal to y. So here also I just slightly extend this definition by ordering it with the equal to definition, equal to condition then this new relation x is equal to y is a partial order. Okay. And this you can take any example, uh, any example, uh, you can work this out. You can 
take any example. Say the divisibility. Divisibility is a partial order. Uh -huh. And if you don't consider a number dividing itself, then it is becomes a strict order. OK, so here is an uh, example. OK, uh, I think here also you can easily convert one to the other. Let's take this example. So these are some Hasse diagrams. Uh, let me explain what these Hasse diagrams are. Then using these examples, I'll introduce some more concepts. Let's consider, let's take a set 0, 1, two. let's take a three element set 0, 1, 2. Let's consider the elements of the power set of this set. So power set of a set, as I have said before, is all subsets. So null is an element of the power set. All these single turns are element of the power set. All, all these two elements are elements of the power set. So I uh, so the uh, my A or the set over which I define the partial order is, is the elements of the power set or all possible subsets of the 0, 1, 2 set. Now uh, let us define the relation as one subset is related to other subset if it is contained in that subset, if it is contained in that subset. So 0, 2 is contained in 0, 1, 2. So there is an edge from 0, 2, 2. Zero. Note that I am not putting the direction because all edges go up, all directions go up. So 0, 2 is contained in 0, 1, 2. So every, every edge that you see here is a content, containment set, containment relation. Now you can easily see the containment set. So null set is contained in every singleton set. Every singleton, these two singleton set 0 and 1 are contained in these two element set 0, 1. Singleton set 0 and 2 are contained in this set 0, 2. Singleton set 1, 2 is contained in this set 1, 2. Now each of these 0, 1 is contained in 0, 1, 2. 0, 2 is contained in 0, 1, 2. 1, 2 is contained in 0, 1, 2. So this is my partial order. Note that transitivity still holds. For example, uh, 1 is contained in 0, 1. 0, 1 is contained in 0, 1, 2. Similarly, 1 is contained in 1, 2. 1, 2 is contained in 0, 1, 2. So by transitivity, 1 is also contained in 0, 1, 2. OK, and note that it is, a, it is an anti-symmetric relation. That means if 1 is contained in 0, 1, and as well, 0, 1 is contained in 1, it would mean that they would be the same set. If they're not the same set, the back arrow will not be there. Okay, so this is a containment partial order over the power set. This is a divisible integer divisibility. This is a divisibility uh, thing. So you take 36 and I write down all the factors of 36. Hmm. Uh, so 1, 2, 3, 6, 4, 9, 12, 18. These are all the factors of 36. And, and uh, mm, there is an edge if the lower number divides the upper number. So 1 divides 3, 1 divides 2, 2 divides 6, 2 divides 4, 3 divides 6, 3 divides 9, 6 divides 18, 9 divides 18, 6 divides 12, 4 divides 12. Uh, 12 divides 36, 18 divides 36. So this is the partial order set. This is the partial order as a diagram. Again, look here, the transitivity is there. 2 divides 36, 3 divides 36, and so on. <coughs> okay, so, <coughs> so you can draw these kind of diagrams. Uh, now, uh, we define one more thing. So if you have a partial order relation, let's say this, I call it as less than equal to, and I have a set A over which this partial order relation is defined. This pair, the set A and the relation defined on it, partial order relation defined it on it, together is called a poset. Together is called a poset. Okay, so, so, uh, you can think of this entire diagram as a poset. It consists of the set A, which is all these nodes taken together, and the relations between them, which is all the edges, which connects up the nodes. So 
So this entire picture is that of a project. OK, so you can represent projects by this kind of acid diagrams. OK, so now if we take these projects and equivalently these acid diagrams, there are two special elements. There are two elements of this poset. Uh, two elements of the A uh, on which this which, which are the elements of the poset. What are the special elements? The elements which lie as the bottom, we'll call it as the minimal element, and the element which lies at the top, we'll call it the maximal element. Which we'll call it the maximal element. So how do you find this? In fact, this need not. Be, uh, I mean, here I have shown in blue they, them for the entire poset, but the minimal and the maximal element can be defined for any subset of A also. So in, if you take any part of these diagrams, any part of this diagram, they also have a maximal and minimal element. Hmm. For example, if we look at this part, see this null one, two and one, two. If I look at only this small part, the minimal element is this null, the maximal element is one, two. OK, so how do you define? I, I, let's say the maximal element I call ma uh, capital M and the minimal element I call small m. So they will M or small m will be called a maximal or minimal element of a subset S. I'm defining it as a subset. It, of course, you can define it for the full poset also. It's the minima, maximal or minimal for a subset so that there is no other element in the subset. There is There does not exist any X in the subset so that the maximal element is less than the uh, uh, less than the uh, x. So there is no element above this, no element which is greater than this. So this, uh, uh, let me first talk about a strict order, then I'll talk about a partial order. Hmm. Let's say this is a strict order. Uh, this is a strict order. So in such a strict order, there is a maximum element so that there is no other element x which is greater than the maximal element. Similarly, there is no other element x belonging, of course, belonging to s, of course, inside x belonging to x, so that it is strictly less than small m, the minimal element. If we replace this strict relation, this strict order strict relation by a partial order, that is the less than equal to relation, instead of the maximal element, you get the maximum and correspondingly the minimum element. So if an, a capital M is a maximum element of a subset S, similarly small m is a max, minimal element, minimum element of the subset S, if for all x, you take any x, it is in the partial order less than equal to capital M and similarly greater than equal to small m. OK, note that note this difference between the maximal and maximum, maximal and maximum. OK, maximum, maximal is you consider a strict order and there is nobody which is strictly greater than the maximum and similarly less than the minimum. Whereas maximum is, is defined in a slightly different way. So, uh, different way. so all elements of that subset are related by this partial order that I, I let me call it as less than equal to capital M and similarly greater than equal to small m. So note this, note this. So this is kind of maximal is kind of defined from outside. There is nobody above outside this, above this. Whereas the maximum is defined from inside. That means everybody inside is below this. Okay. Mm -hmm. But OK, I, I am just uh, telling all these words to geometrically you get the intuition, but these are strict definitions. These are strict definitions. You have to, they need not be geometric things like this. They, they are less than, greater, they, are, they may have other meaning. They have, they have many abstract type of meaning. So you have to be, you have to strictly follow these definitions. Well, these definitions are, are well defined. You can easily check them. Okay, so these are 
other examples. These are other examples. Uh, these are divisors of C. I think uh, let us stop here today. We'll, we'll, so let me quickly recapitulate. We have talked about relations. We have talked about uh, relations satisfying certain property like reflexivity, symmetry, transitivity. We call them an equivalence relation. Then relations satisfying reflexivity, transitivity, and antisymmetry. We talk them as partial order relations. And we talked about total orders, which are connected partial orders. We talked about relations which are irreflexive and transitive, meaning they are asymmetric, and we call them as strict order relations. And if we have, you can represent partial order by this kind of uh, Hasse diagrams, and uh, you can define minimal and maximal element or minimum and maximum element uh, for this kind of strict order and partial orders. Uh, note that. Uh, there can be partial orders embedded inside total order. So if you have a total order, total order is like a chain, and then you can have partial orders if we take subsets. So you take baby chains, smaller chains inside the total order, you take baby chains inside them, and then they can form a partial order. Okay, they can form a partial order. Uh, disconnected baby chains you can take. And uh, so partial orders can be embedded. In fact, this is very important. In the Hasse diagram, if you look at chains and, and if you look at part of chains, and you can easily find partial order and total orders on them. So with this, uh, I think, uh, of course, one thing I didn't take, I didn't take too many examples, but I would request all of you uh, to take in the Kohavi book or anywhere in the end of the Kohavi book, lot of exercises are there. You should work out some examples. Unless you work out examples, you will forget these concepts. So when I just speak about the concepts, it's easy to appreciate them. It's easy to accept them. They are simple. They are intuitive. But you have a tendency to forget them because they are definitions. They are a little bit complicated definitions. So you, if you practice a lot of example, it, it will help you to sort of never forget them ever. OK, so next class, we'll talk about some special partial orders. Special partial orders. And once you study them, we'll see how they can be used to represent logical logic circuits and Boolean circuits. OK, so with this I end. If you have any question, you can ask me. If you have any question, you can ask me. Let me stop the recording.